In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne say, look, God is dwelling here, here with humankind. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. Actually, his people's plural. Interesting. God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. There will be no more mourning, crying, or pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will freely give water from the life-giving spring. These are the words of a man in exile. These are the words of a pastor of seven churches. These are the words of a man writing to his people that no matter what they were experiencing, God, God's reign will rule, and they will reign with God. <clears throat> it is hard to imagine that reality. Most of us often think of John of Patmos as some kind of wild, crazy man who had been alone for way too long and maybe ran into some weird mushrooms and was writing some weird, wild things. I hope not. I pray not, because I want this to be true. You see, John of Patmos really understood and had the imagination to see beyond what was happening now. To remember Jesus' words, to remember God's promise of a new heaven and of a new earth. And John Patmos was true to this and held on to this hopeful promise of God that one day all things would be made right. And so he wrote these words to us. But it is so hard, particularly on mornings like this, to think that this is possible when so much is going so, so very well. Our dear Governor Abbott, he thinks it's fun and good to pick on the most vulnerable, on trans children and their families, criminalizing them, on our immigrant children and their families, scaring them that maybe they will not be welcomed at a public schools anymore and not have access to education. Our Supreme Court is questioning people's privacy rights. People in Austin are getting evicted today and yesterday and tomorrow. And lots of people are wondering how long will they be in a home because they can't afford to pay the rent because it keeps going up and up and up and up. People in our own congregation are coming to me and saying, where will I live? Where will I go? I'm a, a, a member of the board of El Buen Samaritano, and every time we get together, we talk about how more and more and more bags of food are being given away because more and more and more people need them because they don't have enough to pay for rent, and clothing and shelter and for food. You probably heard our, 
precedent, asking us to fly our flags at half staff because we are celebrating, not I'm sorry, commemorating or remembering one million people that have died of one, just one disease. How? How is that possible in this United States, one of the richest in the world? And how is it possible that Texas comes in two, second, second, as the state that has lost the most people to this virus? This state, one of the richest in the country. We actually have more money than some countries. How? And yet, we don't want to pass. Our elected officials of Texas refuse to expand Medicaid, even though we would get more money for it. And this war that continues, it's been over two months. How much longer? And this morning, I was privy of not having to listen to the news yesterday. I had a very nice time with my husband in Kerber. So I turn off the radios and I don't look at my phones. I try not to do that on Saturdays. But I think it's a good idea to turn it on on Sunday mornings because one doesn't know what's happened the day before. And yes, as many of you already know, I heard the news this morning of a young man filled with hate, who was willing to drive over 200 miles from his home to kill people who did not look like him out of fear. Ten died, three more injured. So how, how do we believe these words of John of Passover, how? Because we were charged to do so. We are charged to believe. You see, we are living right now the Easter tide. We are celebrating the gift that Jesus gave to every single one of us. The gift to destroy sin and death to no longer live as we used to, to live in the new heaven and the new earth. That is how we go on to our next day and the day after day and the death after death. Because we believe in this promise of God. We believe in the teachings of Jesus. And you see, we were made we were made in the image of God. And if we believe that we were made in the image of God, and if we believe that God is love, then we are to love. That is how we make this true for us today and for us tomorrow. By loving one another. By being there for one another. By caring for one another another. I, my house uh, has a fence and it's two types of fences. On one side is this privacy fence, not for me, but my, my neighbor needed some privacy and so we, we did that. He was older and wanted to make sure that he was safe and so we did that. But we didn't like that fence so we planted some vines on it. And on the other side we have a little lower fence and some little squares so you know and so we also planted some vines on that side. And I am not a gardener, and I don't know very much about plants, but I do know enough about vines. Vines grow. They are made to grow. It is in their DNA to grow, even those you didn't plant. But these were planted. And so what, on our side, there is a, the fence about six feet tall. And behind the fence is a pecan tree. And the diff 
distance between the top of the fence, which is where the vines are and grow, to the lowest branch of the pecan tree is about 10 feet. And I don't know how it does it, but that vine has figured out how to get to the lowest branch. And it has just managed to cover that pecan tree. That's blessing. Because it is what they were made for. They were made to grow. They were made to find a way to touch and figure out where they can you know, continue to expand, right? The neighbor, knowing that vines can take over things, clipped the vine because it was taking over just, just on the other stage so that it wouldn't go to the tree or do it so right, the fine fine. But, you know, she just clipped that little string because it was taking over the tree. And so the vine was now, that part of it was all brown and the part of the tree was all brown, but it was hanging down. And this morning, as I'm having my cup of coffee, I look up and guess what's happening? Uh-huh, what happened? What's happened? It's growing. And it actually thought, look how nice they made a little ladder for me so I can get to the top of the branch much easier. It is growing on the dead part because that's what they're made to do. And so I offer to you, I offer to you that just like that vine was made to grow, to always extend and extend and find a new place to be, I offer to you, we were made, we were created to love, to love. That is in our DNA. That is how we were created, to be loved, to love. And just like that vine does it, even when somebody clips it and it finds its way, then we too, even when it's hard, even when we get laughed at, even when we get harassed for loving, even when we get, we get embarrassed, we get, we're embarrassed or it gets harder or it's difficult or it, it costs us something. Even then we are called to love. And I, you know, I want to be really clear. I am not talking about that fluffy, oh, everything's wonderful. And you know, the fluffy pink things out there and the cupids and the pink and red hearts floating around. No, that's not the love I'm talking about. I'm talking about the hard, messy, sticky, costly, sacrificial love. The love that calls us to respond to this anger, to this hate, to this injustice in a just way. We say we live in a democracy. Well, then let us practice that. Let us do what we need to do by organizing, by talking to one another, by building relationships so that then the people who are representing us really represent the needs of the people. And that is not easy. That is not fluffy. That's not welcomed all the time. Telling ourselves the truth of how things are and how they shouldn't be and how are we to respond. That is love and that is hard. But we are called to be that people. And I am not calling out, say, one party over another. Let me tell you, there is enough to go around for all of us. That's not what I'm saying. I am saying us as people, as disciples of Christ, who know what our people need, who have heard the cry, then we together have to figure out how are we going to respond to those needs. How are we going to react to those hurts? That's on us. And we are called and charged to love one another. 
as Jesus has loved us. And Jesus says these words, this great commission, the new commission that Jesus, that Jesus leaves his disciple. He says this, interestingly, after he has shared with his disciples of letting them know who's going to betray him. After he has said, somebody will betray me and I will die because of that betrayal. There's a scene that Jesus gives Judas a piece of bread. And I often thought that this was the signal so that everybody would know that Jesus was the, that Judas was the bad one, right? The more I think about it, the more I think about Jesus and how Jesus was taught it, I think it was to teach the disciples that even those who betray us, even those who hate us, they too need to be at the table breaking bread with us. He was willing to feed him, even though he knew that it would cost him his life. And so when I say love, I don't say love just those who we like and just those who we agree with. Sometimes loving requires us to love those whom we do not like, who we are afraid of, whom we know may hurt us. But we love them just the same. We pray for them just the same. Because it is in the loving one another that they will know that we are Christ's disciples. They will know you are mine by how they see you love one another. <clears throat> that is our charge. That is our call, even if it costs us. And so we are called to practice today to live as if the new world and the new, the new earth and the new heaven are here. It is calling us to start practicing as citizens of that new earth and that new heaven. And I will tell you, I do not pretend to tell you that if we do all this together, that it will all be done by ourselves. No, that will get done at when Jesus returns and all things will be made new. I am not going to pretend that I am God and that I got it. We're going to take care of it. That's God's work. But we are called to do our part, to live together now as if the new earth and the new heaven were here, to practice that now. So when Jesus comes back, when it is all made, we will know how to be those good citizens of that new earth and that new heaven. And there will be no mourning. There will be no crying. There will be no pain anymore.